mind if you could turn off your camera, May, and mute yourself. We'll get started here. Recording in progress. Good morning, Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome, welcome to this morning's, morning's webinar. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to, to welcome, welcome everyone on behalf of the Baha'i Publishing, Publishing Trust in, in collaboration with the Willamette Institute for this morning's, morning's session, and um, really, really quite, quite excited, excited about our speakers, speakers this morning. We've got Sharing, sharing some insights, hopefully, hopefully about, about their process in terms, terms of their research and their writing, writing and, and talking a little bit about the books that, that they published, perhaps. Um, so, so I'll, I'll introduce them both, both briefly now. Michael, Michael Day is, is, is going to begin uh, this morning. Michael, Michael um, has, has a background in, in journalism. I won't, I won't go into, into everyone's academic credentials, credentials and all that in, in great detail. detail. Um, I, I think the good, good news is that, that Michael is now currently focused on, on writing Baha'i history. And has uh, recently published a series of books with George Ronald about the history surrounding the Shrine of the Bab. Those are Journey to a Mountain, Coronation on Carmel and Sacred Stairway. And I think also a recent book of photographs uh, called Between and Carmel. So those are all available at Baha'ibookstore.com. Those are all highly recommended. Um, if you don't have those, please, please do uh, investigate those. Those were published by George Ronald and really uh, an excellent contribution to Baha'i literature. Um, but before Michael starts, I'm going to say a few words about our other guest, guest Angelina, Angelina Allen. Angelina has, in, in recent years, years, published a couple of books with us at the Baha'i Publishing, Publishing Trust. She uh, did the biography of John Bosch, which is called John David Bosch, in the vanguard of Heroes, Heroes, Martyrs, Martyrs and Saints. Saints. I may have got that wrong word, but uh, a, a, a wonderful biography of really of both John and Louise Bosch and um, the, the early American, American Baha'i community, community and their interactions with Abdul Baha. And, and then more recently, Angie uh, published with us last, last year in, in uh, commemoration of the centenary of, of Abdul Baha's passing, passing, a book called When the Moon Set Over Haifa, which, which details, details the events of the night that Abdul Baha passed away and gives, gives the reader a, a window into those, into those events, events through the accounts of the Western believers who were in Haifa at the time. So, both, Both of these, these authors are, are people who really, um, I, think I think, are leading the way in, in terms of uh, the depth of their research and the craft of their, their writing. writing. Um, I, I won't ramble on any further. further. I, will, I will say that Michael is embarking on a, a new series of books uh, about the Shrine of Baha'u'llah, which the Publishing Trust is very excited to be collaborating with him on. And, and so I will hand it over to Michael now, and I'll ask you to join me in welcoming him. Remain muted, but 
please, please welcome, welcome Michael, Michael Bay. Bay. Actually, Actually, before, before we, we do that, that sorry, Michael. I, I should, I should, I should just, just uh, 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 make it. There's the Q and A. So, so please, please, if you, if you have, have questions, questions for the authors, use the, the Q and A tab because, because uh, they, they may not be seen if you put them in the in the, in the chat. chat. Um, so, so Michael's, Michael's going to speak, and then, then we're going to kind of transition, transition over to Angie, Angie and, and then when Angie, Angie finishes, we will have a Q and A period, and you, you can, can ask questions of both authors during, during that time. time. So, so I'll, I'll hand it over to Michael, Michael now. Good morning, Good morning from, from Gold, Gold Coast, Coast in Australia. Australia. Uh, it's early, early morning, morning here on a Monday. Um, and it's a, a great pleasure to be able to talk about uh, the, 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 uh, the work, work of writing, writing history. history. Today, Today I'm going, going to talk to you about my experiences um, writing the high history with the hope that it will help and inspire anybody else who wants to do the same thing. So, so all of us who are writing, writing the high history uh, at the moment, we're, we're surely among the most fortunate of all historians at, at any time in the life of humanity, because we are essentially uh, describing the revelation of the latest manifestation of God and the effect of that revelation on humanity. So it, our work describes the past and forms the present and to a certain extent, predicts the glorious future, a united global society founded on justice and love. We're fortunate in that, unlike in past ages, we've got reliable witnesses um, to events that we write about, and we have the amazing assistance of archivists and the technology of um, the guard that Guardian had predicted, the worldwide system of instant communication the internet, internet which, which is also, of course, a massive library on demand. demand. So, so this good fortune, or should, should I say blessing, uh, really, really struck me when, when I was writing up a chapter in my recent manuscript that covers the last two decades of the life of the Baha'i, including his uh, ascension and funeral. Um, this particular chapter describes how Baha'u'llah revealed scripture and just testing out that chapter, I read it to a group of uh, senior Baha'is recently, and the information left one of them in tears and the others rather stunned. And I know it wasn't my writing that uh, my brief words really merely introduced the reports of eyewitnesses. Rather, the effect came from the sheer wonderment of eyewitness descriptions of what happened when Baha'u'llah was exercising his role as manifestation of God and revealing scripture. And it occurred to me uh, that this is the only time in history when we've got detailed and accurate information on what, what happens when a manifestation of God reveals this divine scripture. Uh, we've only got fragments really of uh, how Jesus and the other prophets spoke and behaved as they conveyed their inspired words. Um, and very little on how those who heard them uh, reacted at the time. But in these days, we have the actual descriptions of witnesses whose accounts confirm each other. For example, the one known to history as the Angel of Carmel um, recalled this, and, and I'll quote, the spiritual transformation experienced by those who have uh, attained the presence of Baha'u'llah is so far above limited experience that it cannot be described. But fortunately, he goes on to describe it. It is that paradise which is said never to have been seen by mortal eyes, nor experienced by earthly senses. The experience is like a tempestuous ocean, each wave of which brings forth pearls of beauty. Yet the waters of this ocean are as blissful, are so blissful that one does not even want to swim, but only wishes to be drowned in its ecstasy. This unbelievable joy often comes and passes like lightning. Once I regret, requested to be in Baha'u'llah's room when he was revealing tablets, this request met with his approval. As I entered his room, I heard streams of words sweeping along in a torrential flow from his lips. It seemed that the atmosphere, the floor, the walls, and every atom in the room was filled with perfume. These are, this is an astounding description, and there are, 
others of equal caliber. And it's open and available to historians to find and write about this kind of material, much of which hasn't been assembled or written about in detail before. Today, then, I will speak to you about the topics, uh, choice of topic and readership, the sources of information, the value I see in history or the value of histories, the style, examples and inspiration, different ways of writing your history and working with publishers. But first of all, let's deal with the enemy of all of us who want to write a history and that is the one that's, uh, that uh, um, strikes many a writer and that enemy is procrastination. And a personal example is only after I completed my uh, trilogy telling the story of the Shrine of the Bab, did I find among my papers a page indicating that I had actually um, been considering writing that history to the extent of writing chapter titles, and I'd forgotten about all this, seven years before 2011 when I st actually started in earnest. So the lesson I took from it is start now, don't procrastinate. The topics, uh, now let's look at some possible topics. I think there are many, there are so few historians as perhaps Bahaj, Bahaj really mentioned, relative to the amount of material available that the, the field is wide open. Just for example, um, for example, you could do something about the a story in detail of the letters of the living or the lives of one or two. And what about researching in detail about what Baha'u'llah did in, Bag, in the Baghdad years? How about stories of the individual holy places? Um, yes, they've been written about to a certain extent, but you will have your own take on them. And you will also find that um, many histories have been general, uh, but yours can be in particular on your topic. Your history could even be about your local community or individuals that impress you as my co-presenter Angelina did so well with her great book, When the, Sun, when the Moon Sets Over Haifa, which I recommend describing the experiences and personalities of those six Western Baha'is who had the amazing privilege to be present on the night of the ascension of the master. Now, what about some preconditions? Let's look at a few of the preconditions, I think, for a Baha'i eager to address a historical topic in a book. One is, the, the number one, I think, is you just have to be extremely enthusiastic, burningly curious about your topic. Um, because you'll be thinking about it every day for a number of years. Uh, in fact, to the end of your life, I would imagine, because I think of mine quite often, and I hope that when we enter my fantasy of the Abha Kingdom, which is a great library, I hope that uh, we will continue to think in the next world or to be embraced in that topic when we, uh, when we pass away. But in my case, it took eight years until the final book in my trilogy, Sacred Stairway, was completed and published. So it's a long time to be thinking about one topic every day, whether you're walking on the beach or doing the dishes or waiting on the traffic lights, walking the dog, you think about it all the time. And be, be assured that curiosity is um, enshrined as a basic principle of our faith by the injunction to independently search after truth. Um, a task that I think we should continue with all our lives. And um, it's best, I just say this briefly, but don't let any, any individual put you off because you can find that people say, oh no, you can't do that. You won't be allowed to do that. Or there's not, there won't be any material. Don't, 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 don't listen to that. If that's your topic, that's your topic. And I'm sure that you'll be helped to find the material. My interest in the Shrine of the Bab was prompted by reading in God, passes by the brief reference to the concealment of the Bab's sacred remains in Persia. And that was the spark. I could see that it must be some amazing stories. And I asked around a bit, not that not many people knew much. And then uh, I, was, I, was I was living and working near the shrine of the Bab at, at the time. And uh, I became interested in how the sacred remains were interred in that shrine. And plus I'd always loved the book Chogi Effendi um, Recollections by Hand of the Course, Ugo Giacchieri. So, uh, and now recently I've been devoting a lot of my time to researching the last two decades um, of the life of Baha'u'llah and a brief reason is that um, I've got, a, like probably like all of us, I've got a brief 
I've got a fascination for and a love for the shrine. Now, um, continuing with um, considerations of the topic, we come to a very important one. You must think about whether there'll be many potential readers of your proposed book. This is a, both a commercial and a, and a sacred decision, I think, just uh, tied up in one. Uh, commercial because the publishers, Baha'i or otherwise, they, they need to make money to pay themselves and the staff and to publish more books. Um, so it's best not to waste your time on some minor scrap of information of interest only to you to find that the publishers will um, advise you that that's not something that they're probably going to run with. The topic, I think, is a sacred consideration because we're now involved in a nine year plan uh, where it's obvious judging from the recent conferences around the world, that the morale and the inspired activity of Baha'is um, must be raised to a high level as we engage more deeply and widely in the Baha'i community and the, in the wider community. It doesn't mean our topic has to be of great interest to those members of the uh, wider community, but it must be to the Baha'is, I think. For example, I've got another manuscript underway and I'm quite a way into it. It tells the story of the Ark on Mount Carmel and now this could be somewhat interesting to uh, people who live in, who are not Baha'is and people who live say in the Holy Land or in Haifa, but far and away the most important um, interested people, the important audience will be Baha'is. And we think we know a story in general, we, but we should realize that much of our history, as I mentioned before, is told in outline general and the angels, not the devil, the angels are in the detail. Um, a long term, a long term, for instance, divinely inspired project to build a, sp a spiritual metropolis on the mountain of God involved many people from the manifestation to volunteers in our, in our almost in our current time. And my, my belief is that when Baha'is know about this and about other topics, uh, other historical topics, they will go with heightened enthusiasm. Um, out into the world, engaging in the wider community activities and making many friends from outside the community. And they'll, they'll, sort of, they'll have it confirmed that they're part of a faith whose achievements are more astounding than they previously thought, inspired a manifest, by a manifestation of God whom they now know more about than any other manifestation in history. Now, the, of course, the, in, the uh, questions that, that are raised are, where do we get information on our topics? Well, of course, from other Baha'i histories, you know, and of course, the uh, God Passes By is, is really um, a fantastic source. Um, you, and you, with Baha'i histories, not that the God Passes By has footnotes, but other Baha'i uh, uh, other Baha'i books have footnotes, and also they have bibliographies. So these are sources for further reading on the topic, and you'll find probably branching out into your topic sometimes. And of course, now we have Baha'i Baha archives, our local Baha'i archives, national Baha'i archives, and of course the international ones at the Baha'i at the Baha'i World Center. Uh, other sources, the Baha'i Library Online, I used a lot, and Ocean and the Baha'i Reference Library and others. And of course, magazines, blogs, people's blogs, internet sites, um, and if, if you're doing a more modern history, you can contact those who are still alive, which has been my privilege to do. Um, now, what about the value of history? Um, I think you need, we all need to be assured of the importance of our work. Um, we're unlikely to be making a lot of money. Uh, maybe maybe uh, our, our descendants will, but... Um, you need, an, you, need another drive, you need a driving motivation in addition to satisfying your curiosity. And it's the importance, I think. I think it's the importance of work for others. Sure, there's a definite need for books on such matters as personal prayer and meditation, um, how to energize a 19 day feast, all these um, helpful books kind of topics. Uh, but history for me anyway, takes a special, uh, place to the extent that our exemplar, Abdul Baha, wrote two books that are essentially history, A Traveler's Narrative and Memorials of the Faithful, one of my favorite books. One of the first tasks of The Guardian was, in fact, to translate a history, the one written by Nabil, and, and to which he gave the title The Dawnbreakers, 
Trevi Fendi gave the title The Dawnbreakers, and it was the only book he wrote, and it, um, it was, or the only book he wrote was The Amazing Historical Review, God Passes By, which is an example of compression of information. And in that book, as I did, you can find many ideas upon which you could expand and which you could make your topic. Uh, you can be one of those future historians the Guardian often refers to. The Universal House of Justice also arranged the publication of A Century of Light and other publications with historical components, such as the peace message. Histories are valuable in their own right, but they also can help fulfill the injunction to teach. As the Guardian wrote, quote, the day will come when the cause will speed like wildfire, when its spirit and teachings will be presented on the stage or in art and literature as a whole. Arts can better awaken such noble sentiments than cold rationalizing, especially among the masses of the people. And then we come to style and people will ask themselves, are you qualified to write? Well, you probably are, or you soon can learn to be. Um, there are different styles of writing. I write in a journalistic style because of my background as a journalist on daily newspapers. And um, I attempt to use that style uh, for which it was designed, and that is to interest the masses in a story, to get a wide, a wide audience reading a story and to continue reading on. And not to put the book down and then uh, not get back to it. There are techniques. I mean, there are other styles as well. The style of the academic, for example, which has a uh, great value in that it's maybe while it's pre perhaps less lively but it's faultless in its recording and logic so there is a that kind of style if you're an academic you can do it that way but if you're not uh, either a journalist or an academic and you can but you think you can write good emails or a university essay you can learn the style that I recommend for most new newcomers uh, a journalistic style and there are plenty of manuals out there um, teaching the style and through them, you can learn to start powerfully with your story, how to breathe life into your story by using uh, quoted remarks by relevant people, by using easy to understand vocabulary, active verbs, and a variety of things. There are many tips. Uh, you'll learn to check your work by asking who, what, when, why, and how. Uh, you can also see how the best, best of journalists read it and columnists in prestigious newspapers or to the writers of engaging feature stories in news, your local newspapers, broadsheets or, or tabloids. And none of it comes easy to everybody or any of us really um, as in, an, uh, in terms of that special uh, inspiration that we think of in a letter written on behalf of Shoghi Effendi in 1947. So I think my guess is that it's probably written or penned by Ruhia Khanum with the approval of the beloved guardian. You can see it on page 393 of Lights of Guidance. Uh, the words are, the world's greatest writers and painters have not been under psychic influence, but through innate ability, practice and study have given us their masterpieces. This is a normal way for inspiration to reach us through the channels of our own abilities. So by honing our own abilities and actually stepping forth and doing it, you will find that you uh, attract ins inspiration. And another good thing to do, which uh, prob you probably already do, is read Baha'i histories to see how, uh, to see how their style, to see their style works by, for instance, the great Marzia Gale, or books by modern writers like Catherine Hoganson with her excellent um, books, with the latest one um, I highly recommend, or but two of them I highly recommend, um, and books by uh, my co-presenter Angelina and the two Roberts, Stockman and Weinberg. And how about Earl Redman, who uh, made the jump from being a geologist to find that he struck the most valuable gold in his history books. In addition to the work of uh, finding your style, I suggest you read or rather listen to uh, poetry, good poetry. The best poets are artists who use words to paint beauty. And you can hear many of them on Spotify. And uh, if you listen to the re reciting of poetry, 
um, it somehow uplifts you in the world in the world of language. Um, I find listening to inspiring music, music without words, I can I can even write with that um, music. If there's words in it, I can't write with it. But um, inspiring music, um, and of course, reciting the short prayer of visitation uh, before you write, um, and then asking the concourse on high, especially the Baha'i historians who are now in the Apar Kingdom for assistance. And we must always remember that we shouldn't, we can't afford to bore our readers. We, we are living in an era now of fragmented attention times and we have to accept this, I think. We have, people have been conditioned to scan, so we, we must accommodate that to a certain degree. And I fa find that short, short chapters help and you can have a hanging, uh, leave, leave them hanging with some uh, point at the end of your chapter to drive them on to read the next chapter either that night or that day and the next day. We can, alert, we can learn a lot from Edward Granville Brown who first became interested in the faith from a book, from a history book. And he described it as a masterpiece of his, historical composition, this most perfect presentation of accurate and critical research in the form of a narrative of thrilling and destined interest, such as one may indeed hope to find in the drama or romance, but can scarcely explain expect it from the historian. Well, let's try and make people expect it from the historian. There is a special pleasure awaiting, uh, spending your waking hours being with Baha'u'llah, the Bab, the Master and the Shoghi Effendi in your mind and in their writings. You feel as though you're with them and with eminent believers as you go into these, the detail of, of their lives. And you will surely find, I think, I think I probably speak for most of the high historians that on one early morning or one late evening, or perhaps in the middle of the day, you'll be delving into divine history and suddenly feel this, a mysterious wafting, which you will know in your heart is from the concourse on high. And when dealing with particularly sacred subjects, you, you, write, you write in breathless awe of, of, of what you're writing about. And Sometimes you'll be amazed at the privilege of, um, well, I think of it as dipping your pen in the divine ink and, and letting the words flow out from you. That's the thrill. That's the thrill of being a creative writer at, as a historian. Now, there are different ways of writing uh, your history, but perhaps the way that I do it and might help others to to combat the pro procrastinator in, within us and to start. And the first is um, write a syn synopsis, which is really a summary of your story long before you've completed your research. You know, what is the story that you're thinking of doing? And does it still appear fascinating to you when you've done um, uh, that uh, maybe three or four, 400 words on one page? Then create a skeleton. You could, uh, a list of chapters that you think will fly. Uh, later, you can breathe life into those bones, but at least you can sort of see the, the path out in front of you. And where to begin? Well, it's up to you. Um, with the shrine of the bar, with the books on the shrine of the bar, um, I wrote it in uh, chronological order. In fact, I wrote it all at once. Um, and on the advice of the publisher, we divided it up um, later on, which involved, you know, new starts and new attention to it. Um, with my uh, book on the last two decades of the life of Bahá'u'lláh, with my manuscript on that, I, I, I started actually in the middle, quite a long way in, um, with a chapter on Edward Granville Brown. Um, I was fascinated by how he was drawn into the presence of Bahá'u'lláh, um, and I found a lot of information that I found very useful, very interesting, and information that I'd never known before but then I jumped forward to write about uh, the ascension and the funeral and then I wrote, went jumped right back to 1873 and wrote those chapters the chapters were out of order but my intention was to make each one a fascinating work in itself and then using techniques uh, slot them in to make them a narrative a chronological story um, in fact, the uh, current uh, manuscript I'm working on, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm writing it backwards um, in time, not in words, um, ensuring that uh, the in, I get the information that's available from living witnesses to the art projects of the 1990s. So, you know, it's, it, it's 
it's good to get uh, the words of the people who are actually involved in the historical matters, if you can. And then reversing back down the decades by the story of the seat of the House of Justice, the archive, International Archives and Monument Gardens, right back to right back to the whole. So you can um, write your chapters individually if you know how to make sure that you start each new chapter with interest and finish with uh, the compelling hanging uh, end that um, makes people decide that they want to get back to your book. Right, now we, um, I promised that I would talk about publishers um, and I recommend that you contact our dear Baha'i uh, publishing uh, uh, offices such as the United States Baha'i Publishing Trust and of course, George Ronald Publishers. Um, and you could, you could write to them and tell them what you're intending to do. You could even send your synop synopsis, which is only a page. Um, but they will send you uh, back information about their requirements and uh, you'll know whether you're perhaps uh, you're on the wrong track on a kind of a topic that's of interest to them. Um, and then once uh, they've uh, accepted your um, manuscript, you can be reassured that they have excellent, excellent uh, editors who will assist you uh, once your manuscript is um, really ready to um come towards the process of publication. There are also publishers in India, I believe, and elsewhere. Um, and I self-published two photo books, one on the Shrine of the Barb and uh, one on the Ascension of the Master uh, by the Ingram Spark self-publishing system. But you will need a graphic artist and you'll take on the, the difficult task of promoting your book. So uh, you may want to start, I, I would recommend you start by contacting the Baha'i publishers. Um, so in conclusion, I've addressed the topics of um, choice of topic, your topic, the sources of information, the readership, uh, your style of writing. These are all things to consider to be reassured of the value of histories, examples and inspiration, examples of writers, inspiration, uh, the different ways of writing your story and dealing with publishers. So I hope that it's been helpful and may some of you become those future historians I mentioned before that the beloved guardian mentioned from time to time. And may you be inspired by these words. Abdul Baha wrote to Professor Brown of Cambridge University and I quote, translated into English. You should so endeavor that in future centuries, your history may become the undisputed authority, may be considered sacred history and accepted by both the communities of the kingdom and by the just amongst the peoples of the world. Because the greatness of this cause is not as evident as it should be due to repressive measures repeatedly taken by the government of Persia and the severity of assaults. But before long will its truth, like unto the luminous sun, be seen and discerned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, we'll transition over to Angelina now. Well, gosh, that's just it. It's really wonderful to be together in this effort that we are in. Michael and I were talking earlier about how when we're thinking about our topic, we really live with it and it stays with us uh, at all hours of the day. And I really appreciate that concept of it being with you all the time and I think it, it even stays with you after your work is completed and you you think of other ways that you you can um, improve the work you finished and so maybe that's the torment but I have a screen to share and I'll be um, actually muting uh, video uh, so that the full screen uh, is visible and not interfering with any other video on the screen so um, I think Let's see, I've got um, Boyd is there and going to be muting my video. Um, so uh, really officially greetings to friends and writers near and far joining us in exploring this path of service 
This webinar series is a collaboration between the Baha'i Publishing Trust, whose general manager is Nat Yogachandra, and the Wilmette Institute, which offers programs for social change under the direction of writer and historian Robert Stockman. As we approach developing, researching, and writing historical narratives, it might be useful for us to understand that the United States Baha'i Publishing Trust functions under the aegis of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States and receives its charter as well as general and specific guidance from the Universal House of Justice. The Publishing Trust is a spiritual enterprise that diffuses the word of God in accord with guidance provided by its governing institutions. So when we think about developing, researching, and writing historical narratives, it is vital that our work be illumined by the guidance from the Universal House of Justice. In an excerpt from a letter dated 27 August 2019, the House of Justice states, writing books about the lives of persons who have passed from this world and are therefore no longer able to speak for themselves imposes on Baha'i Baha biographers an obligation not only to be accurate and truthful, but also to represent their subjects with the same respect for their dignity and privacy that is owed to living persons. It is important to note that manuscripts about the Baha'i faith are submitted for review, which is a process aimed at ensuring that the manuscript is accurate and presents the Baha'i faith with dignity. Further in that same guidance from the Universal House of Justice, it says, the availability to researchers of primary sources held in archives, including private correspondence, requires biographers to exercise an acute sense of judgment and sensitivity. The fact that an individual may have deposited intensely private correspondence in an archives, rather than destroying it, cannot be taken as tacit consent to disclose all that information to the general public. As stated by the Universal House of Justice, publishing the contents of a letter containing gossip or other information that the writer would never have uttered or circulated publicly infringes the person's privacy and places the writer of the material in the position of doing something that the subject would not have consented to do while alive. For example, some years ago, I requested from the Universal House of Justice permission to compile and publish the diary papers of Hand of the Cause of God, Keith Ransom Kaler. The reply I received from the House essentially reiterated that because her diary papers are private, it is assumed that such papers give information that the writer would never have uttered or circulated publicly. That is not to say that a biography cannot be written about the life of Keith Ransom Kaler. It just means that information that she intended to keep private must be kept private. The Universal House of Justice states, Baha'i authors should carefully examine the assumptions and motivations underlying the approaches they take so that they may avoid unconsciously imitating contemporary tendencies, for example, to presume that fidelity to truth demands the disclosure of every available piece of information, no matter how unworthy or scandalous, and to mistake a catalog of private details for the true and lasting meaning of life. The true and lasting meaning of life. It can be told in so many ways and with accuracy and dignity. Baha'u'llah states that our purpose is to work for the betterment of the world. So it seems to me that this can be the theme of the lives of those we choose to write about. When Martin Luther King Jr. was asked how he would like to be remembered by future historians, he said, I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Quite often, the people we choose to write about are deeply humble souls 
who never imagined that in their life it would be chron in, that their life would be chronicled after their death. I am thinking of American poet Emily Dickinson, who was alive in the world at the time of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Although she was not directly aware of the teachings of the Baha'i faith, certainly she was influenced by the effect of Baha'u'llah's presence on earth. She wrote hundreds of poems on little pieces of paper and kept them tied up in small bundles under her bed. And after passing, her poems were discovered, and she is now regarded as one of the most beloved of American poets. And yet, to tell her life story, one cannot ignore that she herself felt her own humility and smiled at it, as in this poem, I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell, they'd advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell one's name the live long June to an admiring bog. If we are to give due diligence to the humility of our subjects, how much more then is the humility required of ourselves? With the help of the guidance from the Universal House of Justice, we are not only guided in developing our narrative, but this same guidance from the House can apply to how we conduct our research. We have easy access to the Baha'i writings, to literature, to newspaper articles, to ancestry records, and in some cases to oral histories. You will find the most precious treasures in our national and international archives. And because the treasure chest there is vast, it is important that you are very specific about what you are looking for. For example, when I was researching the life of John Bosch, I asked the archives office if it had any letters written from John Bosch to Louis Gregory. The archives office replied that it did not have letters from John Bosch to Louis Gregory. So I emailed again and asked, does the archives have any letters of correspondence from Louis Gregory to John Bosch? And the archives replied, yes, and sent me copies of two letters from Louis Gregory to John Bosch. Then I got to thinking about Louis Gregory, and I remembered reading in the Star of the West that he had a Baha'i teaching partner named Roy Williams. Together, they formed a teaching team and traveled throughout the southern states to teach the cause of Baha'u'llah. So I asked the archives if it had any letters of correspondence between John Bosch and Roy Williams, and the archives office replied, yes, Roy Williams and John Bosch corresponded as early as 1922. And in one instance, Roy wrote to John, the master so wished to have a constant intercommunication between the individuals in the cause, both by visits physically and visits by pen. So the archives can be a great resource, but you'll have to be specific about what you need. In addition to reliance on the archives throughout the development and research stage of your project, we have a wealth of Baha'i literature that can be useful during the research stage of your project. For example, in my research for When the Moon Set Over Haifa, one of the Western believers present in the house of Abdul Baha on the night of his passing was Dr. Florian Krug. While I found a great deal about his life in the society pages of the New York Times, I was struggling to articulate a connection between his material life and his spiritual life. There is a brief vignette of him in Marzia Gale's Arches of the Years, where she writes, Florian Krug, attended Freiburg University and was a member of the Hasso Baruso Studenten Corps. This means his face bore scars. He had fought 47 duels. He was especially proud of a deep scar running almost the length of his jawbone on his left cheek. Well, indeed, this prominent scar is visible in every photograph I found of him. And I knew there had to be some transformation from the pride he took in this scar to the humility of spirit he developed after becoming a Baha'i. So I looked up information about the Hasso Baruso Studenten and learned that it is a student academy that uses 
mensur fighting as a mental training exercise. Mensur fighting is not a duel. Rather, each opponent must stand his ground in a fixed position and strike at the other from that fixed position. The aim is to maintain one's position, even if it means enduring a smite to the face by the opponent's sword. The wound will become a scar and thereby become a permanent mark of being able to stand one's ground against any opposing view. Florian Krug was a master of this mental exercise. The scar on his face bore testament to his ability to oppose anyone whose ideas did not agree with his own, and he held firm until he met the great master, whose love completely disarmed Florian Krug and transformed Dr. Krug's pride to true humility. So when it comes to actually putting pen to paper, it is a process interlinked with the development and research stages of your subject. And while it is important to explore elements of style, to my knowledge, the Universal House of Justice does not recommend any particular style. Rather, its guidance directs us to be accurate, truthful, dignified, and respectful, all of which can be achieved through a variety of styles. After all, when writing about others, we are essentially writing about the common struggle we all share, which is to gain the victory over our own selves. Baha'u'llah writes, arise, O people, and by the power of God's might, resolve to gain the victory over your own selves, that haply the whole earth may be freed and sanctified from its servitude to the gods of its idle fancies. We know that the perfect example of this call to gain victory over self is Abdu'l-Bahá, who is like the moon, which has no inherent light of its own and gets all of its light by reflecting the light of the sun. Abdu'l-Bahá's life, therefore, is a perfect reflection of the light of the revelation of Baha'u'lláh. And we too are like the moon, striving to reflect the teachings. But for us, it is though we are in a perpetual lunar eclipse where the light of the sun is blocked by the earthly distractions of daily life. And yet we know that when the earth comes between the sun and the moon during a lunar eclipse, the light of the sun still emanates beyond the earth. If we were to stand in the shadow of the earth and look toward the shaded side of the moon, we would see that the moon is not in complete shadow. In fact, what is called a blood moon should actually be called a sunrise moon because the glow on the moon is as though it is reflecting 360 degrees of sunrises emanating from the sun's rays reflected around the earth toward the moon. This analogy can help us to remember that we all reflect the rays of the light of the sun, no matter how much our spiritual reality is shaded by earthly shadows. As we approach the writing of a biography, therefore, we are ever mindful of the guidance given to us in the writings of our faith that can help us to correlate the finite aspect of human existence with the infinite progress of the human soul. In a talk in Paris, Abdu'l-Bahá explained that absolute repose does not exist in nature. All material things progress to a certain point, then begin to decline. A bird soars to a certain height, and having reached the highest possible point in its flight, begins its descent to earth. Then Abdu'l-Bahá says, now let us consider the soul. With the human soul, there is no decline. Divine perfection is infinite. Therefore, the progress of the soul is infinite. So when writing about a person, we are thinking about the infinite progress of that person's soul within the context of that person's finite life in this world. 
this pattern of rise and fall is illustrated in many of the patterns we see in art. For instance, in Hokusai's Great Wave off Kanagawa, created by the way in 1831 during the lifetime of Baha'u'llah, we see this theme of rise and fall in every movement of the painting. This pattern is integral from the largest movements in the narrative to the smallest movements. These shapes of ascent and descent and the repetition of these forms gives the story dynamic motion. And when we examine their, the narrative as a whole, we are drawn into the action and we cannot ignore how these forces act upon the protagonists of this scene, the courageous boatmen who surely must conquer themselves as they face the forces of nature. Writing and historical narrative can be a lot like writing a story or a play. Act one is the exposition of your subject. Act two presents the rising action of the story. Act three is the climax. Act four is the outcome of that climax. And act five is the resolution. If we are to be faithful to presenting a person's life with the dignity it deserves, this pattern of exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and resolution should show how the resolution transitions your subject to a higher spiritual state in his or her life. This can be the pattern of a single chapter, and the chapter that follows begins where the point of resolution began and the next chapter progresses from there to your subject's next resolution. These traditional patterns can be useful, but they are not absolute. Nevertheless, we are drawn to patterns that we find in nature. For example, this tree is shaped in a natural way, whereas this tree is not. The difference is that this tree does not follow a coherent pattern. Trees and narratives, for that matter, follow a natural pattern created by the forces of nature. A tree will branch out in repetition of its fundamental structure. And as we think about the events in the life of our subject, it can be the very structure that gives light to the development, research, and writing of the narrative. If we can discern the basic pattern of a human being's life, and if we can map those patterns together as a whole system, then we can begin to put into writing the narrative of a person's life. And hopefully, you will find that these natural patterns illustrate the highest attainments your subject can make in both the finite realm of human existence and the infinite one. I wish to conclude these thoughts on writing about the lives of those who have ascended to the eternal realm by thinking about the 2022 Rizwan message of the Universal House of Justice and its use of an extraordinary image of an ark at sea. We understand that the ark refers to the cause of Baha'u'llah. Nevertheless, we writers of historical narratives can hardly resist thinking of how this metaphor of the ark might also suggest to us the great voyage of life with its crises and victories, its advances and setbacks, its egress and regress, as each of us makes our way toward eternity. The Universal House of Justice writes, the believers know that whatever storms lie ahead, the arc of the cause is equal to them all. Successive stages of its voyage have seen it weather the elements and ride the waves. Now it is bound for a new horizon. The confirmation of the Almighty are the gusts that fill its sails and propel it towards its destination. And the covenant is its lodestar, keeping the sacred vessel set on its sure and certain course. So in many ways, as we write about the lives of those 
who've passed on, we are making sure that that sacred vessel is set on its sure and certain course. Okay, I'll start my video again here. And um, let's see, Boyd, start video. Okay. All right. I'm back. See, I can't hear anybody else. Well, thank you so much, Angie, and, and thank you, Michael, both uh, for such wonderful and enlightening and really illuminating presentations. Um, this, this was particularly exciting and, and helpful, I think, um, to hear you both talk, you know, in quite practical terms about, about your process and um, so much of what goes into writing and researching a historical book. So uh, again, if people have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, not in the chat. Um, they probably won't be seen in the chat. So uh, a few things have come in. Um, let's see, uh, I, I answered a couple of questions uh, in the chat and the Q&A just regarding submissions information for the Publishing Trust and contact information for the archives. Um, let's see, there's one a uh, relatively simple question from Michael that was just, uh, please have Michael repeat the quotation about how in the future people will flock to the faith and if he knows it offhand, where it's from. Yes, I do know where it's from. Uh, uh, also, which one is it? The, um, oh, the, from the Guardian. Um, No, I don't have the uh, I don't have the attribution here, but it's quite it's quite uh, easily found by just googling some of the words. That's the good thing about Google, by the way. Nearly all the quotes, um, but, uh, you only have to know a few of the words and put Baha'i in it, and you usually find the uh, the quote uh, on Google somewhere. So I'm sorry, I don't know that one. That's fine. Um, okay, well. Uh, there's a few things here. Um, I'm trying to find some things that might be uh, applicable to you both. Um, let's see. One, one person says, can you share some more about what to include and what to exclude from a historical narrative? I wonder if either of you have additional thoughts on that. Um, I, I have uh, some thoughts on that. Um, thank goodness for the review process. And uh, we, uh, if you wish to publish through the United States Publishing Trust, uh, it, or well, if you wish to publish any work that explains about the Baha'i Faith and uses quotations from the Baha'i Faith, it has to go through review. And it's such a protection for us and helps us to um, make sure that we are, are um, on, on target and, and being fair and accurate. And so some of the things that we really wish to include, um, it would, we would be guided from that. I've certainly been guided from, uh, from things that I wanted to write and was guided away from stating it that way. Um, it, 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 Cause it falls into like personal opinion. And um, so I have a lot of personal opinions about some of the, the uh, history of a person's life, but unless I can support that with, with actual details from that person's life, then it's just my own, it, it's too much of an insertion of my own personal opinion. And uh, as, as far as I go, I suppose I'm uh, so used to writing as a journalist that, um, you, I'm used to um, excluding extraneous material for the fear of clogging the story up with too much 
irrelevant material which stops the flow of the story and and will stop your <laughs> will stop your reader uh, reading. I remember sitting in the bus once looking at someone reading my story on the, on a on a newspaper and then turning the page before they'd finished and I was most offended. But I should really been looking at my own style and um, thinking, oh, I mustn't have made it interesting enough. So, um, in addition to what Angelina says, which I endorse, um, obviously the um, the task of a of, of a writer is somewhat similar to a sculptor in that the sculptor sculptor can see in the marble the the figure that's going to emerge from it, and they spend a lot of their time um, taking away excess material, and so. Um, always keeping in mind the reader, always keeping in mind that you want them to keep on going till the very end. You have to make sure that your material is relevant on point and interesting. Um, and I think you'll, you'll find that uh, you'll be tempted sometimes. <laughs> we're, we're all tempted to put in everything, but we do have to be disciplined to, uh, to make the story interesting and um, mobile, moving on towards the, um, the end of the book. Uh, someone's asked Angelina specifically uh, if you could expand on how you implement the tree and its branches as a way of writing about and organizing material regarding a person's life and uh, maybe maybe there'll be thoughts from Michael just in terms of uh, how you go about organizing yeah, I, you know, I think, and I love the way Michael said that a lot of the way his style is influenced by journalism. And, and I think it's so important that every one of us here, like I, I see some people on this call who are, you know, Tom Lysat's on this call and he's a playwright and certainly his way that he will write will be influenced by the fact that he's a playwright. Other writers are, other people on this call are philosophers and have philosophy as their kind of their, their background and and so the work would would end up being very philosophical my um my background is english literature i taught uh the 12th grade course uh, for um, high school students called advanced placement english literature it's a college level course taught at the 12th grade level and i, I taught that I, I taught high school for 32 years and so my background is is really British literature and um, much of the way that we understand the a story is a branching out. And I just really firmly believe that as Baha'u'llah says, the, that, that nature is the mirror of the divine. And so in nature, we can find the clues to how we should operate in our lives. And so a tree, is really a symbol of how we can think about a story. And we, we have, a, like, for instance, if we think, I, like right now, I'm thinking about the life of Keith Ransom Kaler. How can I think about her life in a, kind of a simple structure? And there are many books can be written on Keith Ransom Kaler. So my approach might, might have this structure. And then I think, well, how can I branch out from that that simple structure and and just add branches and even maybe blossoms to the to the threads of that structure so it's a kind of an organic way of thinking about writing a person's story um, so it's it's just a, an approach but I the other thing I'll say about uh, considering nature um, when we look at the tallest living thing on earth, that's a redwood tree. And if you, if you know what the, the seed of a redwood tree looks like, it's, it's, it's teeny tiny. And if you take that seed and you put it in your hand, and then you look at a redwood tree, which can't be photographed, it's too tall, it can't be painted. I mean, they defy um, encompassing it into one frame. But everything that tree is going to be is in that seed. So there's some, some truth to looking at the seed and, and thinking about the growth of that tree to where it gets to the size that it is. And how can I imitate that in the spirit of my writing? It, it might be 
just too esoteric for some writers, but it does really work for me. I find that very interesting, um, listening to somebody who specializes in the structure of, uh, of, of a story. Um, in journalism, we are, we are taught um, several styles. One is direct news, some, one is feature stories, where, for instance, in a feature story, you have the uh, diamond um, structure where you have an interesting anecdote leading into the meat of the story and then concluding. In a news story, you start off with the most important and you, you finish off with the least important. And it's the opposite to a university essay where you're building up to a climax. So there are different styles. And um, I was just thinking of the climax of uh, my story of Journey to a Mountain, um, the story of the transfer of the uh, sacred remains of the Bab and the building of the shrine and the interment of the sacred remains. Um, the climax really comes on page 29, I think for me, but it might not be for others. And that's when um, the, uh, the way of carrying the sacred remains was um, discussed uh, with the guidance of um, Abdul Baha. But with, with the story about, um, with the book about um, Baha'u'llah, with the shrine of Baha'u'llah, the climax comes at the end because everything is leading up to um, his interment in uh, the, the sacred shrine of Baha'u'llah. That's a very active process. But prior to that, the stories about individuals, the appointments of the hands of the cause, the uh, role of how Edward Granville Brown was drawn in and what, what he saw and did, um, how the Kitabi Akdas was revealed or what the implications were to pilgrimage and uh, uh, other, other topics like that, uh, as I mentioned before, I tried to make each one of them um, valuable in themselves, but with that um, ongoing inner, not tissue, but uh, energy that's leading towards the great moment of uh, the ascension of the manifestation and the establishment of the shrine. Um, with the Ark uh, story, I'm not sure what the climax is going to be then, because as I mentioned, I'm writing it backwards, but I'll have to review that um, and uh, look at all the material once uh, laid out and and see where the climax is ar um, arise. Um, but it is very interesting. And I uh, found that uh, what Angelina said uh, informative, and I have looked at some of those um, but in, in general detail, some of the structures that uh, experts on the um, structure of books and stories um, have advised. So that's all very useful for you. There is a question here that might um, might be valuable to for, for both of you to discuss. Uh, they say when you're writing a narrative, how much leeway does an author have for creative license to create a scene for the audience? In other words, where are the lines between nonfiction, creative nonfiction, and fiction? I love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> I say go for it, and then yeah. and then um, see how it turns out. And with the review office, it can we can. Um, I mean, I, I just wouldn't, I hope no one, sorry, but let me just go even bigger. It, you know, ev all of us who are together on this call, we are uh, really in, on a path of service. And this is how we see our ability to serve the cause. And that's, that means we're sincere. And that, um, that desire to wish to serve this way should be pursued with pursued with all our hearts. In Joy DeGruy's presentation last night, she talked really about the importance of um, tell, beginning to tell the stories of Baha'is of African descent, and so that those stories shape the our understanding of our faith as American believers, and it. It, it, she's opening the floodgates and it's wonderful. And uh, the, the playwrights we have in the cause are, you know, ready and able to begin um, embarking on this, this 
effort to serve the cause by creating literature that it's inevitable that fiction and nonfiction start to um, come together. And I, I, there, there might be a, a, way, a time when those we cross the line, but that's the value of review. And it's a real protection to ourselves. But I, I, I hope that we all really throw ourselves into our, what our desire is and see what comes of it. Um. Yes, I agree. And I think that, um, you know, you're, you're, you're not just assembling a list of facts, you're writing and you, you, you try and have a flair for your writing, you try and um, make it um, interesting, compelling, uplifting, uh, motivating to, to incorporate some of the things in your lives to, but to finish the book, as I say before, you get all the information to be uplifted. Um, and so there are, the, the, but this question is very, very relevant because in some cases you have to assemble and tell a narrative from the clues um, that you have. Um, and so, uh, but so attentive to accuracy that I feel um, coming from a journalistic background, although some of you may um, feel that journalists don't strive to be accurate, they do actually, uh, good journalists do always strive to be accurate i hated it whenever i got something wrong and um so the uh the process that helped guide me through it was i foot <laughs> in the, somebody complained actually about my books too many footnotes and there were a thousand of them in the coronation of carmel's so that person had a point but i didn't know what why they objected to having more information but anyway um so i try and back up everything that i say but on the other hand um there is some license in assembling lists of clues. And then, um, in fact, in, uh, in, in some parts of my writing, I say, we don't know for sure, but this is what probably, this is what, what could have happened. This is what's likely to have happened, I should say. But saying this very carefully and um, making sure that you don't prescribe exactly what happened if you don't know. Um, and this is, a, this is the test of the writer of the search for, for truth, for accuracy. Accuracy is so important, um, but also is style and beauty. Beauty is very important, um, and to make your make your text beautiful. And I took notice of what Angelina said about Mr. Lysart being on uh, on the on screen, and I thought, oh, this is a person who knows about this. Um, and his book, you know, and his book, read his book, and um, you. Um, you're engaged in a creative process as well as one of historical um, accuracy. So, Yeah, you know, I just want to also mention, and it came up in the question about the process of review. Um, and it is, um, I, I just wanted to share that the review office of the United, at least for the United States, and of course, uh, George Ronald has its review process, but for publishing in the United States, you would go through the United States Review Office. And um, the, they are wonderful. They are um, guided by the directives given to them by the Universal House of Justice. And they, they can't uh, go out of that, but they're, uh, is such a, a love for those individuals who write for the Baha'i faith and wish to put forward uh, a, a narrative from their voice. And there is, I've never felt that there is any kind of, um, it's, it's all positive. I can't even describe the negative because I can't think of it that way. And um, if the, the review office doesn't feel that its staff has the ability to review the work. They they find someone who that that who is an affiliate of the of the office to review the work so that it it they consider all of the important cultural points of view, the um, the the stylistic points of view. So I I really want to reiterate that to my knowledge. The Universal House of Justice does not recommend any particular style because uh, stories can be told with dignity, respect, truth, 
and accuracy in many styles. And so that I hope is encouraging. Um, I, I, if I can say, just say a couple more words about this subject. Um, and, 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 you know, this is just now my, my, just my personal, my personal view. <laughs> I, I could be completely wrong about this, but Coralie Franklin Cook, Sadie Oglesby, those are two women in the history of the Baha'i faith whose lives, gosh, I would love to write about, but I don't feel that I have a, an understanding of the struggles that Coralie Franklin Cook had to face as a Baha'i of African descent, nor do I feel that I can really place myself in, in the, the mind of Sadie Oglesby as a Baha'i of African descent in the United States. This is a story, in, in my view, and I'm sure, I know some people might disagree, but this is just my view, that this is a story that is better told by a Baha'i in the United States of African descent. So I think that um, it's just really great that we're all together in this and that we're helping each other and encouraging each other because the more diversity that we bring into the, the, the group of writers, both racially and uh, academically, the richer will be the, the literature that we can produce here in the United States. Yes, and sometimes I've felt that I should put at the front of my books, this is not an authoritative history. It's not from the Universal House of Justice or from the central figures, but I thought that might undermine the book if I did that. But obviously, we are going to um, occasionally... Um, well, I remember once when somebody was teaching us about consultation, they, they said, think of the truth as, as like a ball, a coloured ball, and we're looking at it from different perspectives. And somebody on the other side of the ball will say that the ball looks to them blue, but from our side, it looks red. So we are, consultation involves the joining together of everybody's view, looking at it from different perspectives. And um, I think that, you know, historians, you know, you try and look at it from, a, from what really happened. You are re really looking at it to a certain extent from your own perspective. And, and we, will make, we will make mistakes. And I think also a special word about writing about uh, the central figures. Um, Shogi Effendi fascinates me, you know, um, and I was so interested the other day to learn that he was left-handed except for his writing, which he used his right hand, because he'd been trained at it. He'd been trained in that at school, forced into using his right hand. So those sort of things interest me. They're, they're minor things, but, you know, it's a fascinating uh, aspect of his life. There are so many fascinating aspects of his life, but when it comes to the manifestation, uh, Bahá'u'lláh, um, Marzia Gale said that the more <laughs> the more she wrote about it, the more elusive the understanding came, and that's when you realise this is the manifestation of it. You cannot, in your own writing, contain this figure. You can like he, he's so magnificent that from so many areas that you can't, in the end. And Abdul Baha, of course, and the Bab are the same, but a whole lot which who I've been looking at. Uh, reading about um, so you know you can't you can't be um, omniscient um, you but as Angelina was saying before, using those beautiful quotes before about dignity and respectful you have to breathe respect when you're writing about the manifestation and, and the central figures and um, but you're not necessarily going to capture every aspect of them we're well, not going to be able to capture every aspect of them but you can capture some aspects so that hopefully um, will um, tell the story, will um, inspire and illuminate and, and, and encourage people to read, read for themselves. I, I can't resist, uh, I, I hope it's okay if I do this, I can't resist seeing uh, Jesse Villa Gomez on this call. And you know, I, I grew up in Latin America, I grew up in Argentina and um, I, I, I just want to do a shout out uh, to Latino writers and the uh, the gosh the need for that and 
um, it, hopefully so many things will branch out from this webinar, so many possibilities and opportunities. Thank you both. Um, I've, I've seen several questions that are kind of practical things about publishing and review and, and submitting things uh, for publication. I just wanted to mention that we, we have another webinar today at two o'clock central, three Eastern, and that's a panel discussion um, with staff from the Baha'i Publishing Trust and George Ronald, as well as the review office here in, in the United States. So that will be a session to really get um, practical information about, about a lot of those subjects. I think um, there's a number of questions, but I think a number of recurring themes that, that you've both touched on um, related to a lot of these questions that are coming in. So I don't think we're gonna have a chance to go through all of them. Um, one thing that has come up a little bit is just archives and sort of um, accessing unpublished papers and things like that. And I wonder if, if, if both of you might have a few thoughts on that. I do, but Michael, do you want, I feel like I've talked a lot. Michael, do you want to start with the archives question? <laughs> You're the expert more than me. Um, I did, um, for the Shrine of the Barb, I did go to the uh, US archives and was so impressed with the service that Roger and Lewis and others gave me. And you, you, do, you do have this wonderful feeling um, of uh, looking, oh, I couldn't believe looking at the actual handwriting of some long, passed on famous Baha'i or whatever. Um, the, the thrill of it is, is, uh, is something. Um, and um, so I got some uh, great information and photographs from that archives. And, and in the Australian archives, I saw the movie that, uh, uh, the, saw parts of the movie that was taken of the grounds, you know, in the 1950s of the, um, of the gardens around the shrine, things like that. I mean, you, you find some magical things and you find some information. And uh, in terms of these, you get assistance from the Baha'i World Center. Um, obviously they're very busy, but um, when I try to restrain my, uh, my questions to them um, for the crucial aspects, but that's, they provide a um, loving service there. So that, that's good as well. Um, I think that uh, over to you, Angelina. <laughs> uh, well, it's important to remember that if, if you write to the international archives uh, at the World Center, you won't hear back right away. It, it, it might be a month, maybe two months, three months before you hear back. So um, you, you just have to have this long view of your the development of your story and not think that I mean it's going to take a couple years to complete a project or three years so you can't think that it's going to take you know maybe just a year so that, that I, I confess that I had to learn that the hard way I thought well, God, why haven't they emailed me back you know when I, when I first my first email to the international international archives i'm so <laughs> embarrassed um and, and then the, our national archives uh they are very uh swift i mean and i mean you'll hear back within two weeks and that's fast i think um and so Ed Sevchik is the head of the U.S. Archives now, and he has a staff, Roger Dahl. Um, Lewis Walker has retired, and um, so he has a, a growing staff there. And um, But th I'll tell a story about the, how, the wonderful thing about the archives. So Gwendolyn Edder Lewis, who wrote Lights of the Spirit, has a chapter in there about... Um, where she has published Coralie Franklin Cook's letter written in 1914 to Abdu'l-Baha. I'm pretty sure it was 1914. And it's where Coralie Franklin Cook says, pours her heart out to Abdu'l-Baha and says, this is what's really happening right now in, in the American Baha'i community and in the United States. It's, it's such a wonderful uh, letter and so just beautiful 
in how she concludes it about her devotion to the cause, despite the shortcomings of the believers themselves. And so I thought, gosh, I like, I wonder, I wonder what else is, is in, and I wonder what else is available. I, Gwendolyn Edder Lewis got this obviously from, from an archival source. So then I was continuing my reading of Lights of the Spirit and Gwendolyn Edder Lewis mentions Sadie Oglesby. So I thought, oh gosh, I've got to know more about Sadie Oglesby. So I wrote to the uh, archives and I, I said, you know, I know that Sadie Oglesby wrote, I mean, uh, spoke at the 1927 uh, Baha'i Convention. Um, do we have a transcript of that? And of course, the answer is yes. And yes, here's her, the whole transcript of her of her talk. So it the the treasures there are absolutely astounding, and it kind of makes you wonder, gosh, what else is there that I I don't even know about? So um, it just means that you just have to keep searching and keep pushing and not don't be afraid to write to the archives they're so generous that's what they're there for but just be patient because they may not be able to answer your question as quickly as you thought they might <laughs> um, for that purpose oh and one more thing sorry i i've written to archives in other countries i've written to the archives in japan i've written to the archives in germany i write so you can write to the archives all over the world and and get all kinds of wonderful things Yes, I had that experience with Germany and uh, Ed and, and his team in the uh, United States and the, and the Baha'is in Australia who do that. Um, one thing I was going to say is don't fall, I would suggest don't fall into the trap of thinking that there is some, some body in Haifa who's got your full story and can tell you it. There's not. Your story is going to be original. They, they'll, they'll have information, but there's nobody there sitting there writing up your story you have to figure it out and um some of the things that i figured out I, I figured out via photographs as well analyzing for instance the path of the uh, the funeral of abdul bahar and things like that and where the where certain things were at that time you can find through photographs aerial photographs and other things so there's not <laughs> I used to think, I think, that every, there was somebody in Hyper who knew everything. <laughs> but, uh, you know, your story is particular to yourself and your job, your, one of your roles is researching and finding it for others. And um, that's part of the excitement. Well, thank you both so much. I think, I think we've covered a lot of the themes that have come up in these questions um, without necessarily addressing every specific question. but. Um, those of you with more practical questions about publishing and, and the process and, and editorial and review matters, um, do try and tune in for the, for the seminar later this afternoon. But thank you so much uh, to Angelina and Michael for giving us their time and sharing their insights today. This has been, this has been a wonderful session. Yeah, thank you to everyone. Yeah, thank you. It's really nice to be able to talk about your books to others. <laughs>